Uh, this is the first of several events of this type. Um, uh, we had a little try last year uh, with a, an event called Podcast Club, and uh, we enjoyed it so much that we thought we'd, we'd do it again. And uh, we tried to get this going as, a, as approximately a monthly uh, get together for a little chat on 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 different exciting uh, topics. Um, kicking off this year, we have uh, three wonderful panelists, um, and uh, I will um, uh, uh, very very briefly introduce them and ask them to say a little bit about themselves, and uh, also for them to to tell them what their favorite work of science fiction is and why. Um, one of the things that uh, our three wonderful panelists have in common is they're all very, very accustomed to being in the limelight. So uh, firstly, uh, I'll introduce Kirillie Rule, um, the experimenter. Um, and most recently, she's fe been featured in national news talking about a silver bullet for brain cancer so, um, Kirili, tell us a, a little bit about yourself and what your favourite sci-fi is. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So, uh, as a day job, I would call myself a neutron scatterer. So, I work at ANSTO, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, uh, located just south of Sydney. And there I do investigations into condensed matter. So, my main uh, passion, I think you could say, in terms of research is in low dimensional and exotic magnetic materials. So that, that's my day job. My volunteer job is that I'm also the, the National Honorary Secretary of the Australian Institute of Physics. Um, so that takes up a fair bit of time uh, coordinating all of the, uh, the, the national events going on. And it's great to see um, uh, Graham joining us as well, who's been coordinating the um, uh, Women in Physics lecture tour through New South Wales. Um, so welcome. Um, right, my favourite sci-fi uh, probably has to be The Expanse. So this is a TV series from Amazon Prime. Uh, I've just finished watching the fifth season and I think perhaps that's why it's so fresh in my mind. Um, I think what I really like about The Expanse is that um, space is vast. We all know space is vast. Um, what I find that a lot of uh, sci-fi shows and movies really don't um, grasp is the distances that we get in space um, and the time it takes to go through all of this space. So what I think, um, The Expanse is really nice. It's sort of uh, mostly set within our solar system and it really takes into account time correctly. So if someone is sending a message, uh, it takes, minutes or days before that message arrives uh, where it's meant to get to. Um, some other things that I think are really good about um, The Expanse, they deal with gravity really well. They've got magnetic boots. They walk around with magnetic boots on. Um, they had a really lovely um, uh, uh, scene in, in one of the recent episodes where they let some water go and, and I don't know how they filmed it, but yes, there was water droplets, you know, floating through the air and everybody was sucking them up. So they were, they were dealing with weightlessness and, and um, uh, gravity very well. And the final thing I want to say about um, uh, The Expanse is it also deals with um, motion through space really well. So, I mean, there's no friction in space, but so many of these shows that we watch have always got their thrusters going. They're going at impulse. They, you know, have to get up to warp speed. Um, in, in The Expanse, they understand that once you set your acceleration, you just keep going. There, there's no friction. And to slow down, in fact, the whole spaceship in the expanse has to flip and then they have to start sending their thrusters in the opposite direction just to slow down. So I think that, um, you know, scientifically, uh, the expanse seems to tick a lot of boxes for me. So, you know, this is one of the reasons I really enjoy that as a sci-fi. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Curly. Um, uh, let's move on to... Geraint. Geraint Lewis is uh, from the uh, University of Sydney. He's our theorist um, and uh, he's a very long time presenter and panelist uh, for a, a range of uh, uh, online events uh, run by new scientists. So uh, very, very famous around the world. Geraint, please tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Um, okay, so yeah, my name is Geraint Lewis. I'm a professor of astrophysics at the University of Sydney. Um, I'm originally from the UK. I can actually see my home just over uh, Scott's left shoulder there. I come from South Wales. And I'm actually, I come from the land of the Silures, which is the ancient tribe that used to occupy the lands of South Wales. And um, my research interest is on the dark side of the universe. So I'm interested in dark matter and dark energy, the stuff that sort of shapes the, you know, the growth, the expansion, the evolution of the universe. So all of my research is around trying to work out what is out there in the universe, uh, which is hidden from view, but we can sort of detect it's there from its gravitational influence. Um, favorite sci-fi, that was a hard question. Um, I struggled a little bit. I'm a child of the 70s, so I grew up with Doctor Who. So that was one of the, the key TV shows in my formation of science fiction. But my favorite work of science fiction is actually the thing that Doctor Who is based on, and that's The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. And, you know, it was great when I first read it because it was science fantasy, the, the notion that you could travel through time. But as I went through my education and I learned about relativity, then I realized it wasn't quite fantasy. It was something that was at the edge of actual science fact, the possibility that we could bend and warp space and time such that time travel was a, a, a thing that could be possible, might be possible. I'm not even sure what the right word to use here is that somewhere at the edge of physics, time travel is is a possibility. And this still enthralls me to today, is the notion that we have Einstein's equations and in there is still the possibility that we can travel through time. And I love the story from H.G. Wells, of course, it was written before Einstein had this idea that space and time were in intermingled. And even in the Time Machine book, he talks about space and time not being separate objects, H.G. Wells said, you know, they were one sort of unified concept and they were malleable. And he goes, of course, on this fantastic journey out to essentially the end of the earth, right? He, he's, he's the final sort of travel scenes. He gets to a dead earth just as the earth is about to expire under a blood red sun, etc. And then he travels back and forward again. And as I said, it, you know, it, it was written in a, um, the Victorian ages. It is a Victorian piece of fiction, but it just ties so beautifully to the science that came so soon afterwards with the work of Einstein. So uh, it's, that, that is one of my favorite works. I find it one of the most inspirational works, but there's a lot of sci-fi that I actually like. Thanks, great. And uh, our final panelist tonight is uh, Thibaut Molnar, uh, the philosopher. Um, he, uh, his brush with fame, uh, there have been several, um, uh, have been uh, through the ABC. Uh, he was a guest on the Philosopher's Zone. And uh, I think last year he was, uh, he had a pretty much a, a whole episode of the science show all on his own with, uh, with Robin Williams, uh, entitled Are Theoretical Physicists Mad? Uh, Tibor, tell us a little bit about yourself and your favorite sci-fi. Thanks, Scott, and good evening, everyone. Um, well, about myself, I, I guess my day job is that I'm an armchair philosopher. Uh, I, I'm a student of understanding, I guess, and, and I spend my time trying to make sense of what Kiralee and Garant and others do uh, to try and work out how the world really works, uh, if there is such a word as really. Um, in my spare time, I'm an aspiring dilettante. I have to say that that's probably about the best description I can offer. Uh, I'm older than all of you, uh, then, and, and my favorite sci-fi is actually 2001. I'll go all the way back to the 60s. It was decades ahead of its time. And it was perhaps one of the most brilliant depictions of AI. Uh, it, it was almost intelligent, you'd have to say, or perhaps it even was depicted as intelligent. It wasn't out to get you. Uh, it wasn't out to destroy the universe. The movie didn't end up as a cowboys and Indians chasing in the sky, which, which I find a bit tedious. Most sci-fi movies end up like that. The Star Wars series is an example. Um, 
And at the end, it became very, very philosophical. It raised questions about the meaning of life, about the value of, of scientific inquiry versus the survival of the people on the spaceship and so on. So I found it a very meaningful and, 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 and very deep penetrating kind of sci-fi. Um, and it, it wasn't, okay, it was 1960s. It wasn't all that far ahead in, in special effects and so on. But I don't think that's what sci-fi is about. I think sci-fi is really about probing the relationship between humankind and technology, if you like, or between science and philosophy, if we want to use other words for it. So uh, somehow I think that is the genre of, uh, of AI or, or the genre of uh, science fiction that, that I'd like to actually to see more of. Thank you, Thibault. Um I'm going to ask the question to the, uh, all the participants now, um, uh, because uh, I ran a, a, a forum once that uh, on, on uh, space, and, uh, and uh, an astronaut had actually snuck in, and um, it, was, uh, it turned out to be wonderful because uh, he came out to the front and there was an incredibly excited uh, impromptu Q&A, um, but uh, are there any uh, participants online who actually have credentials on our topic tonight that uh, would like to like to be uh, acknowledged and introduce them, themselves anyone from fox studios perhaps no seems not okay <laughs> um so let, let's talk a little bit about sci-fi um as an introduction as we get into it uh and and, and I, there are a couple of things that i just like to uh to mention, firstly, uh, I, I think um, obviously it's a combination of science and fiction, um, but I guess the fiction part, it, it really depends on when it was created re relative to technologies that, that came before and came after. And, and it, I was reflecting, um, my grandmother who died about five years ago was born in 2020. And um, no, I think- wasn't. 1920 perhaps? 1920. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I was describing the grandmother paradox. <laughs> uh, she, um, you know, back in her day, you know, it was uh, a lot of people didn't have electricity in their houses. Um, the cars were hardly there. The Wright brothers hadn't sort of chucked their kite down a field. Um, people didn't even have electric fridges. Um, and if, if she had read, at the tender age of zero, um, uh, an account of what any of us here today had done during the day, it would have been pure science fantasy, um, uh, even what we're doing right now. So uh, I, I guess it really depends on when it was written. Um, and I, I guess the other thing to touch on is, is um, uh, and, and I'm sure this is going to come out quite strongly in the discussion tonight, is people have different um, appetites for the level of scientific rigor in their, their science fiction. Um, and um, uh, there is actually uh, a Mohs scale of hardness when it comes to um, science fiction. Um, it goes from one till about five or six. One is extremely soft, plush even. Uh, and uh, it's it's uh, like the the completely fantastical. Um, the um, the examples there that uh, that I've seen are Doctor Who, where it's purely entertainment and and made up fantastical stuff, and uh, Futurama. Uh, moving on to level two, it's still pretty soft. Um, I, I would think examples like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Red Dwarf might be in there. I had a look at the, the episodes in Red Dwarf, actually, and I was actually um, amazed at the amount of science in their, uh, um, in their episodes. I must go back and watch some of those. Three, three is getting into the, like, the medium zone. Uh, I would say maybe Star Trek, Avatar are in there. Um, my favorite is number four, and that's the, the category that's called One Big Lie. So the whole story is based on just negating one law of physics perhaps uh allowing time travel wormholes 
uh, whatever it might be. Um, and then just exploring how that sort of propagates through and the consequences of, of, of that through the story. Um, and uh, I think examples of that would be um, contact, which is, you know, uh, wormholes existing. And, um, and one of my favorites, uh, Minority Report. Um, uh, so, I mean, the big, the one big lie there is that the pre precognition of future events exists. Um, and then, and then the, everything flows from that. And Minority Reporter, I, I believe, was a, a Philip K. Dick mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, he's phenomenal. Definitely one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to five, um, that's, that's very sort of factual based, uh, based in the, the very plausible, um, often sort of cautionary tales of, of, you know, what happens if we carry on going like this type of thing. Um, uh, an example of that is her, I think, um, yeah. apart from the ending where it gets a, a little bit weird, I think, as far as I remember. Um, and you know, that's a, that's a, a movie about science fiction with hardly any special effects in it at all. I mean, it's all based on mobile phones. Um, and that is a, a very precautionary tale, I think. And then six, um, is uh, what they call mundane sci-fi. And that's just trying to predict what our lives will be in 20 years time and almost making a sort of a, uh, a documentary of the future. So uh, we all we all sit uh, at different places on that spectrum, what our favorites are. Maybe, maybe we, uh, we're good to go all the way across it, but uh, let's get a little poll up here and see if if anyone has what your, if you had to choose one of those uh, sci-fi hardness levels, where would where would you sit? Now, can, can I clarify? Is this for entertainment purposes to go see a movie, or is it for believability? Oh dear, I, I'm, uh, I'm going I'm to check in another point here as well because, uh, as you've noted, with this hardness scale science fiction is a bit of a grab bag. And to some people, it means that the science is fictional, but it's not necessarily the case. It, it might be a fictional story involving science. So, you know, science fiction is such a broad basket, right? Mm. And so as, as Kirali said, is it, is it entertainment or is it realism that we're after here? And I think it depends for me, you know, just what kind of mood I'm in when I'm walking into the cinema. And that would fit in with the hardness scale here, uh, where, as you say, Garant, uh, the science is fictional. That'd be down the soft fantasy end. It'd be down the one end. Uh, and where the science is good, hard science, then the science fiction would be up at the sixth end. Um, and in fact, uh, I suppose there's a couple of distinctions I'd like to draw too, uh, to help color in the, uh, the hardness scale. Uh, one of them is that I think that uh, science fiction and cold, hard-nosed science, the kind of science that Kirley and Garant do, are actually a continuum. There's sort of a seven on that scale, which is actually doing science. I wonder where the division line is. Can we draw a line between science, as in real, hard, good science, and science fiction? I'm not sure we can. I think there's a point where theoretical physics, where we start thinking about uh, wormholes and so on, really starts to sound like science fiction or some sort of science fantasy or something because we don't know we have no evidence that they exist but we may one day find out and of course the pursuit of finding out is part of the game we play so you can tell a story about that so i i, I don't I, i'd like to ask where we can draw a line between science and science fiction and the other thing i'd like to do is to as, as Kirley suggested i think uh, is to draw a distinction between science fiction and technology fiction, where what we've done is we've made some new gadgets, we've got some whiz-bang gadgets that we've now made that we don't yet know how to make, and we build a science fiction story around the gadgetry as opposed to around the science. I think there's a number of examples of that kind of science fiction around as well. And uh, I don't know where you'd put technology fiction on this scale, you'd have to put that somewhere around the five or six or something. 
Yeah, but again, you know, the question there is um, how many other laws of physics do we need to bend to to uh, make a story or make a make a fiction, make a make um, a movie based on this technology? Yeah. You know, for example, anything set in space, there's got to be corners that are cut. You know, as I said at, at the beginning, you know, the distances are immense, the time. You know, it takes eight minutes for the, the light from the sun to reach the earth. So how can you have back and forth conversations in space? But if you don't do that during a movie, your movie's going to take too long and no one's going to buy the ticket to go and see it. So, Yeah, yeah and, and your movie, the, your favourite, The Expanse, would have to qualify as slow TV. Exactly. <laughs> so, so coming in with the, the theoretical viewpoint, I'm... Um, uh, I know that um, yourself and uh, so currently and, and Scott, et cetera, are uh, more based with the, the physical world around, around you. This is actually get your hands on, but being a theorist, the notion of warp drives and wormholes and even time travel is not out of the question for me. It's, mm. at, the, it's at the edge of what I would call science. It's, we, maybe we don't have them now, but the equations say that they are possible just if the engineers can pull their fingers out and build this kind of stuff. I mean, the theorists have sorted out the problems already. Th then they could be realities in the future. So um, I'm already pushing down that scale about what I consider to be the difference between science fiction and science fact. Yeah, that's right, which is why I think it's a continuum of a sort. Uh, somewhere up at the six or seven end, uh, science fiction bumps into science. I think that's right. But I tell you, if, if you look at a scale like that, that Scott just had on the screen, you know, one to six, are people, now this is almost, you know, a psychological question. Mm -hmm. are, are people going to avoid saying one, or maybe that's too soft, and avoid saying uh, six, you know, they do the Goldilocks thing, they'll, they'll choose the middle one um, because they get a little bit of, of both in their world, you know, the, the sort of the real fantasy of, of, of a science fiction movie, but, you know, uh, something that is like Geraint was just saying that you can believe in it can possibly happen. For sure, yeah, and, and I think people will enjoy at different times, depending on what mood they're in and what they had for dinner, uh, they'd enjoy a different genre of, uh, of sci-fi because there's something to be gained or enjoyed in, in each of those categories. So it's hard to say. Uh, Scott, of course, mentioned that he did have a favourite. He was somewhere around four on that scale. He liked the one big lie story. Uh, it may be possible that we are disposed to enjoy a particular kind of sci-fi more than others, but I'd be hard-pressed to pick a, uh, pick a firm point along that scale and say, well, that's where I sit. And I enjoy sci-fi at many levels. Yeah, I guess I am um, reflecting on what you've said, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff in, in category one that I love as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, a Doctor Who that Geraint talked about. Um, uh, but let me pose a, a slightly different question, because I think it's, it's um, uh, there's good sci-fi in any of those, I think is probably what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. Is there bad sci-fi, and if so, yes, definitely. Scott, the thing about the bad sci-fi, I think it's the thing that's got its own special name, probably called science fantasy. Explain. It was just called yeah, silly I don't like. <laughs> There's a point where sci-fi just becomes silly. I think. Yeah. When you put Michael Bay in charge of a movie, when you, he's got to have lots of explosions, <laughs> that, that's when it turns into science silly. The, uh, I was going to say, um, um, there's a certain thing about science fiction, which some of the science is not exactly correct, but um, people are willing to accept that sort of thing because of the sake of the story. Now, <clears throat> I, I think a good example is The Martian. You know, I, I, that's a very one of my favourite modern ones because I think, being an astrophysicist, I, you know, I've studied Mars and you know, everything seems pretty good there. I mean, I, I know there's the thing mentioned, I mean, the atmosphere on Mars is only 1% pressure on the Earth, so there's no way the wind's going to blow over the spacecraft and things like that. But I'm, I'm willing to accept that for the sake of the movie. Um, so, you know, but you don't want something all the way through, the science itself being, you know, a ridiculous sort of thing, you know, someone you know, um, being able to stand on Mars for an hour or something like that and then getting somewhere and then sort of coming back to life or something. 
But I also think um, with uh, Durante, I, I actually, I'm a, mostly a, um, um, I, I work on experimental physicists, and I know Durant sort of likes to think about wormholes and time travel. I will sort of accept some things about like um, wormholes and, and that sort of stuff um, for the sake of the movie, because you want people to move from one star system to another. You don't want them to take a thousand years, so they use wormholes and stuff. But as far as time travel goes, I, I certainly I do disagree with you, Grant, on that one there. I, don't, I think that's one of the few things in the universe that will be absolutely impossible by any stretch of imagination. I'm talking about going back in time a thousand years or something like that, but that sort of idea I, I really don't like in movies and stuff personally. So. Okay, so I'm going to put my theorist hat on and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to tell me why you think time travel is impossible. Is it because you think that there is something in the maths that is wrong or relativity is wrong or do you just have a gut feeling that you don't like time travel? No, uh, it, it's more than a gut feeling. I mean, you talk about Einstein's equations and this and that, but I mean, Einstein's equations give a whole lot of um, possible outcomes and what theorists often do, they ignore the ones, you know, a lot, a lot of them and then say, oh, these are nice and those are nice. And some of these attract a lot of attention like in science fiction and stuff. I mean, for the example, you know, things like, um, you know, all these different universes comes from inflationary theory um, itself and things like, um, uh, you know, the, the um, when you've got uh, stuff like um, uh, all these extra dimensions and stuff that come from string theory and something like that. So, I mean, you know, I, I think there's virtually no evidence for any of those things and and maybe some of those things could be true, but I, I think they have a plan that I mean, a lot of people talk about as if, oh yeah, these things are gonna come along in 50 years, 100 years, where there's absolutely no evidence for them. I mean, things like magnetic monopoles have been observation of uh, experimental people say, yeah, they're, sorry, theoretical people say they're around as well. None of those have ever been seen. Um, and things like polarization from the uh, Big Bang, which is caused by inflation theory, again, that's never been seen at all. So the, I mean, the basic evidence goes against all those sort of things. So uh, there's so, evidence that we have anyway. So, so, so I, not, not that I want to take over this entire thing. I actually made a, a, a podcast recording this morning about this entire issue of the of hypothesis building in science and this this entire notion. People just say, we don't have the evidence. That does not mean we will not have the evidence in the future. And I think that we are wrong to approach science by saying that, um, we can't have this, that, and that because we have no evidence now, because evidence changes, right? Things change into the future. And what we should do is we should be open to the possibility of what our mathematics, mathematics tells us until we know that that route is actually closed. And at the moment, w relativity still allows time travel, right? It's, it's in there. Godel found a, a time traveling solution back in the 19... 40s is one from the 1930s. They, they exist in the mathematics. We just do not know uh, one way or the other if they could exist physically. And I said, I, I'm not gonna say yes or no, but I think we are wrong to say, no, this doesn't exist because of where we are now. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that some of these things are possible. Um, I mean, science today is different to science in a thousand or a million years time, but to sort of treat these things as if, oh yeah, they're almost certainly time travel and this and that. I mean, I, I, you're looking at, you know, where probabilities are. I mean, time travel is different than sort of like um, um, going faster than the speed of light, using warp speed and, and using, uh, you know, all these sort of things. But time travel is probably one of the most far fringy sort of thing that you can almost have in science. And they're certainly overplayed anyway. Uh, okay. Again, I don't, I don't want to take over this entire podcast, but I'm just going to just mention that in quantum electrodynamics developed by Feynman, uh, the electromagnetic force is communicated between particles by the exchange of a photon. And how is that photon exchanged? It's by the particles talking to each other and agreeing that they will exchange a photon and one sends a message back through time. That's what the mathematics says, right? So we say, oh, we can't have time travel, but already written into our, uh, our fundamental theories is a, a, a rubberiness, a sloppiness when it comes to the notion of time, the notion of causality, it goes out the window at some level. So I think I, I'm, my message is, I think we have to be very careful about 
ruling out what might be possible in the future until we can really say we've ruled it out. So right. I, I, I might just finish the whole finish my last little response to that. Um, it, it's not necessarily a thing about ruling it out, but I mean, the, and theoretically, you've got the, you know, the wave equation and, and the collapse of the wave equation, whether those things actually, they're a mathematical thing, whether they, and they work, but whether they actually exist in reality is a different sort of story. So, I mean, that because the mathematics says something, where the mathematics is designed to actually make, to predict things and, and having things working and this and that, but whether they actually exist because of the mathematics, like the wave, the wave equation, um, the... Um, uh, whether the wave equation and all this in, exist in reality is a, it's a different sort of story. And I think science in the future will actually uh, work towards explaining all of those things from a, from a physical point of view. Yeah, uh, again, I'm gonna say one last sentence and then I'll, I'll definitely move away. I, in the, my conversation this morning, I said, I'm gonna get a t-shirt made and my t-shirt is gonna say, at the start of every discussion of physics, everyone has to define by what they mean as real. Okay, and then we can go from there. So the real in physics, I think, is a very difficult concept, which I think Thibault could go on for hours about. But we should, we should move on to a different topic. I think we've, yeah, And uh, Hawking didn't like time travel either. Uh, but <laughs> Hawking's one person. Anyway, sorry, Scott, back to you after we uh, <laughs> hijacked the... Uh, I'm mute. Yeah, you're Scott. mute, Scott. It got very physicsy there for a, for a moment, which is uh, and we're you know it's gorgeous. It is it's gorgeous. Um, yeah. Let's let's take it back to some of the fiction. Um, and I have another question for for the panelists here. What what um, what sci-fi technologies that you've seen uh, in books or magazines or or films do you think that? Uh, we, we stand a fairly reasonable chance of seeing come true in the next sort of 10 to 20 years. Shall I start? Yeah, please do. Well, I, I'm glad you've just put the 10 to 20 years on it because that just cuts my idea way out of, way out of the picture. Something that has always thrilled me, I think, is the idea of teleportation. You know, beam me up, Scotty. Uh, being able to move from one place to another uh, another place, you know, in the blink of an eye. Um, I love that technology. I can see how useful that technology could be. Um, to the point that I remember when I was at Monash Uni, I even did a, a, a whole project looking into quantum teleportation, where we were up to how you could get, um, so it's not actually moving particles from one place to another, but it's um, moving the information from one set of particles, the wave functions of, the, of these particles, and imprinting them onto uh, similar atoms at the target location. So, um, you know, while we're, while we're only looking at qubits and tribits and small, small, tiny things that we can do that with at the moment, I could imagine that this could work with larger and larger objects. So this for me is is one that I think could be plausible and maybe not 20 years, maybe 100 years. Uh, that that That's what I would say for that. Thanks, Karen, let, me, let me ask you, um, where are we up to in this? Uh, I know that we can teleport the quantum state of a single electron or a single photon. I know that's been done. Yeah. But I, and, wonder and we can, we, I wonder if we can actually do it with two. And the reason I'm asking that is because if you want to teleport larger objects with, with many particles in many states, you have to read those states, presumably using some mechanism that reads them either one at a time, or, <coughs> excuse me, you have many devices that read one each. Yeah. And then you can this... transfer them all. But maintaining synchrony, I think, is going to be the problem that, that stops us from doing teleportation. Do you agree with that view? I... Absolutely, you do not want to lose the information, and I think I think quantum teleportation is so highly linked to quantum computing, uh, for more ways than one. Um, the idea of uh, entangling information, and then disentangling it at another location, is sort of the foundation for quantum cryptography. Mm. Um, you know, and we're we're looking at um, you know, it, like you said, if you if you lose coherence of your wave functions during the transmission, then suddenly you may end up without an arm on the other end 
or, or similarly, if you've got a gold filling in your tooth and they don't have gold where you're going, you know, what happens to your tooth? <laughs> so. Yeah. But I'm even thinking more, more primitively at a basic level, in order to read out the quantum state of whatever it is you want to teleport, you've got to make it stand still long enough for you to read it. And I just wonder if that's possible. Uh, because the, the world doesn't stop while you read it out using some sort of quantum teleportation machine. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. Um, so I'm just wondering how we get around that problem. Do you, Garand, do you have any ideas about how we might go about holding things still long enough that you can actually read the quantum state of a large array of, of bits of, of, of something and then you can actually entangle it and teleport it all at once? But how do you get to read it? So, uh, look, I, it is not definitely not my area of expertise, but I have delved into the philosophy of teleportation. And Penrose wrote about this, about whether or not a teleporter is really a teleporter or a cloning machine. Mm. And hmm. whether or not whatever pops out at the other end is you or not. And this was used in the, the movie, and I've forgotten the name of the movie. I think it had Hugh Jackman and David Bowie play in Nikola Tesla in it where they invented a teleportation machine, but the original was still there and had to basically die so the, the other one could carry on, et cetera. Um, so I think there are deeper, I mean, deeper questions about whether or not you are really cloning or you are truly teleporting yourself because we haven't even touched on that terrible word that physicists hate, right? Consciousness. Can you teleport that from one place to, a, to another? So I don't know if you can read it, but uh, you could read an entire human's um, quantum state. But I think there are bigger questions about whether or not you can uh, actually teleport an individual from one place to the other. Yeah, I agree. I think cloning is marginally easier than teleportation. I accept that. But you need all the raw materials at the other end. You need a good supply of gold fillings. Uh, but my question is, if you, if you are thinking of something like consciousness, let, let's go back just to the basics of the physics of the brain. If you want to clone a brain, then you have to hold the brain still. You've got to freeze it at absolute zero long enough to read out all the states of where everything is, where every neurotransmitter happens to be and the state of every synapse. And then you have to teleport that. Um, I'm not sure you can hold it still long enough to actually read out 100 trillion bits of information. It, it's, that's the bit that worries me. That's the bit that I find is conceptually the stumbling block that in order to read something like the brain, you've got to hold the brain still long enough. You've got to freeze it in order to read out all the information. But, but that's I don't know how to do that. That's an engineering problem. I'm sure they'll fix that <laughs> at some point. I, I think they're doing that at Ansto already. <laughs> I, 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 what, what about what, what other technologies do, do, does anyone think that, um, that are tantalizingly close? Well, let me throw in a book. Um, I read a book years ago, which I found very disturbing. It was a book by the author David Ambrose. I don't know if you've read it. It's called Mother of God, not to be confused by any other book, which is also by that title. There are lots of Mothers of God books around out there, but there's one of them by David Ambrose, which is a sci-fi book, which is about artificial intelligence again. There is this uh, woman at Oxford, uh, hypothetical, many time, many years in the future, and she's working on AI, and she's managed to develop something which passes the Turing test, and this AI device decides to take life into its own hands and goes meandering around the internet, and it gets chatted up by some crack in some crank in America who decides they want to destroy the world, and between the two of them, they set about doing some strange things. The book goes a bit pear shaped at the end, but I, th I think the idea of AI one day making up its own, making its own decisions and getting away from us is a, is a tantalizing concept, uh, even if it's horrifying. It's a tantalizing concept and it may well happen. We already have uh, viruses and various other things floating around the internet, which are beyond humans to control. There are, system, there are processes out there on the internet that humankind cannot stop without eliminating the entire internet. They really have got a life of their own. They do go around the internet and do what they do. Perhaps, it's, perhaps they do good things. I mean, we wrote them to do good things. These are not evil uh, bits of software, but there are bits of software out there which are no longer in our power to stop. So I just wonder if that's not a possibility that sometime in the future, some sort of AI will decide to get a life of its own and go out there and start taking over the world. So, not in a bad way necessarily. I don't, I don't mean any harm by this. 
uh, but it's just something that can happen. And I found that tantalizing. It was a, a very, it was realistic. Um, it was a, uh, um, I've got some notes here. I, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who was used as a consultant uh, to actually make sure that the software was all logical and it all, all, all seemed reasonable. It's a, it's a very good book. I can recommend it if you want to be scared out of your underwear. But, but just to point out, this is not a new idea, right? There's a uh, science fiction movie from the 1960s called Colossus, the Forbin Project, yep. about, pre about precisely this idea that they yep. build a computer to protect America. And it works out that Russia, when you know, it was just the USSR and America, had built a similar machine and they get together and decide that they're going to run the world instead of humans. And even um, David Bowie in his, one of his um, more esoteric stages, he had a song called Savior Machine, which is all about a computer that was designed to look after mankind and uh, you know, make sure the world is a wonderful place. And the machine gets bored with people. And it's about what the machine decides to do. So this idea that once you've got consciousness going on inside a machine and it gets to make these decisions about whether or not we, we are the you know, the, the target that we are the thing that it wants to look after, or we just become the pain that it wants to get rid of, it has been floating around for a long time. We think it's a new idea with regards to, it's come up a lot in AI, but it's been around for a long time. Oh yeah. Well, David Ambrose's book goes back to 1995. So you're right. This is certainly not a new idea. 1995. That was a sci-fi idea that could one day come true. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I, I'm going to check in a, a couple of other uh, technologies, right? I mean, uh, I think we forget about how rapidly uh, technology has advanced and wh what we, where we're finding ourselves now with regards to access to information um, that we, you know, on our phones, we can access, uh, you know, movies from the 1920s and all, and, you know, text from 400 years ago, et cetera. I think very soon that, that we are going to have a access to all information in the palm of our hands, right? Everything is going to be eventually be scanned and be online and we'll be able to find anything and we will be overwhelmed with information, but it will be the greatest, you know, library of Alexandria there's ever been. There will be all that information will be there in the palm of our hands. And I'm, I'm sort of looking forward to that because there are TV shows that I sort of partially remember from the 1970s that I would like to see again. Probably it would destroy the, the shows for me kind of thing. But, you know, there, there would, there's just so much information that we will soon um, be able to get our hands on. I, I can't guarantee that's going to be a good thing because clearly the internet has not been just a force for good, right? There have been um, uh, negative sides as well. But I think it's going to be a very different world when you can access everything with, without any sort of issues whatsoever. And I don't think we're that far away from that. I mean, the rate that things are going at the moment. Now, Geraint, when you say in the palm of your hand, are you almost alluding to a wearable device? Oh, oh yeah. Well, for, for, well, I haven't got very big palms, but no. uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I do wonder about this, about, but rather than the palm of my hand, but just straight into the eyeballs or whatever, right? I yeah. mean, I, I think that that is, is sort of next. I know that Google Glass may yeah. not have worked, but I think next time round. Certainly, certainly some of the materials that I'm working on are looking at uh, reducing the dimensionality to make them very thin um, and, and thin being very flexible and flexible then being wearable. So, you know, then you can start wearing your devices. Um, and I think that that's sort of a, a fascinating idea. And I mean, this, this comes back to things even like, like tricorders on, on Star Trek. You know, you've got this device that almost looks like your mobile phone and it scans the body. Well, you know, is that real or is that real? I'm, I'm wearing a Fitbit. Now, this is scanning all my bio signs. It tells me how I slept at night, what my resting heart rate is. You know, is that much more different you know and if we're now designing materials so that they can be flexible and and wearable how far away are we from this sort of technology well clearly i i hope you're at the same time working on developing fusion power because we're <laughs> going to need to drive this massive internet that provides all this information at the moment today the internet consumes more power than the international airline industry ever did so, yes uh, 
we're going to have to fuel this and we're also going to have to work out how to build very, very many more hard disks because I think we now need to make hard disk faster than we can fill them. So just in terms of the power consumption, Tibor, um, do you know how much power your mobile phone is using? Uh, I'm guessing it's really only about a watt or two. Well, so then if you consider how much it uses when you surf the web for YouTube videos or Google Maps, your phone is using the same amount of energy as about two household fridges every day mm. in terms of yep. the amount of energy from data centers that are processing the data, the, the Wi-Fi towers yeah. that are bringing it to. So you're exactly right. And, and of that power that's being used and generated, two thirds of that is lost to heat. Yes. It's, it, it's inefficient. So, you know, I, this is also part of the research that I'm doing right now is looking at finding more energy efficient materials or, or efficient ways um, to deal with energy. So mm, well, anyway, that, I, won't, I won't jump on that any further, but that's, yeah. Well, more force to your arm. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about the AI, I, I see more of the AI as being an aid to people. So a bit like those science fiction where you have troops and things like that, where they're going along and they see someone and you think, who is that person? The AI said, oh, that's uh, T-Ball over there. Oh, yeah. Uh, when did I see him last? And it tells you, oh, yeah, we last met two months ago at a conference. And he said, oh, hi, Tebo. I haven't seen you since a conference two months ago. So I, I see the AI as being helpful rather than annoying. Having all these data flashing up in our faces becomes so sort of annoying. I know my wife's got one of these bits there, Kira Lee, and she's sitting, she's been walking out for two hours and she's sitting down for five minutes. Next minute is telling her to get up and start moving again. So, I mean, I, I think the AI needs to be something where it's actually an aid and, and you can say, well, how's my house going? How's my dog at home? Yeah, everything's fine, Graham, you know, everything. And then you don't talk to unless you wanted to respond to something. So that would be, I think, much more uh, friendly AI rather than something that's bugging you all the time. I think the key for me, and uh, if, if you haven't seen the movie Her, um, I, I really highly recommend it. it, it, mm, it I have. It's it's a it's about a guy who's who's got a mobile phone and and you know it's got the usual sort of um, digital assistant voice recognition on it, but he gets an upgrade and it suddenly becomes conversational, and uh, rather than saying you know flush the toilet and switch on the oven, um, it, it's a point where you, you know he can't really tell whether he's talking to a human or not, and. Um, I, I, you know, there was a, it, 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 I, I gave a talk at a palliative care conference, which is really weird. And, uh, um, and I, I touched on this and it, it's really to do with loneliness and in aging. And, um, and, and the question I was asking, I guess, was if, if you can talk to something that's a machine and you know, it's a machine, does it really matter um, that it is a machine if it, and, and, if you do, even if you do know it is a machine, will it alleviate your loneliness? Um, and the great thing about a, an AI is that if you've got dementia and you're saying the same thing over and over and over again, or you forget things, then an AI is going to have like an infinite amount of patience. Um, you know, there's all the sort of cultural and lingu <coughs> linguistically diverse stuff that we need these days to you know, uh, to care for people from who've come from other countries that, that we just don't have the infrastructure for. And I don't know, does do, do, anyone, I, I mean, I, to me, it, it, it seems this is actually tantalizingly close. And um, I think the scenario in her is, is very, very real. Mm. Um, it, you can, you can, and if you, if you don't believe me, just watch the movie and it will persuade you how close it is and, and it, you don't need uh, an, uh, a physical representation of, of the personality, a voice is, is enough. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I guess it's, it's not really sci-fi, but it's um, in reality, what is it gonna do to our society when people are able to converse with, uh, you know, a perfectly patient, perfectly supportive, AI that will be better than real life. <laughs> so well, uh, these, these are topics that, um, that Black Mirror looks at, right? Mm. Black Mirror is about the future of just after tomorrow. 
And that's precisely the kind of questions that they're, they're addressing. And of course, some of it goes into a bit more fantasy than others, but all the episodes, you can sort of go, all right, that doesn't feel like it's that far away. There's a very interesting example of this uh, in a robotics laboratory somewhere in the States. I have a paper here about it, where they were building a face and they were teaching it to talk uh, and they were making a mock-up of a human or a mock-up of something that was recognizably a face. And everyone was perfectly happy with the fact that it was a machine until such time as the, uh, the head researcher put a pair of eyebrows on it and made it go up and down somehow in keeping with what it was saying. Instantly, everybody in the laboratory fell in love with it. it that's all it took. So it's something very simple, something very deep innate within us that makes us relate to things as 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 conscious as conscious entities as humans as beings as 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 partners or mates or whatever they are whatever you want to call them, uh, but it doesn't take much for us to be seduced uh, as is for example the uh, the guy in the movie Her which was I agree it was a terrific movie. So we have relationships with AI. We will have relationships with AI, and it won't take very much to get us to do it. That's a little bit what Patrick has just put into the uh, the chat actually alluding to the, the relationships yes, that's that right. we might have. So yeah, that's exactly right, Patrick. Yeah, what, what does the context matter? I, I, I thank Alexa every morning for telling me what the, the temperature is going to be that day. Oh, thanks, Alexa. <laughs> well, it's interesting, in fact, that um, I, mean, I, I spoke to a robot person, people who work a whole lot in robotics, and they said the reason why robots have human shape is because they look more, they actually look more human and people can sort of, you know, work with them easier, but they said it's not a very efficient shape actually for a robot to be. But having a robot that uh, has eyebrows or actually has human shape, it sort of, you know, bonds a bit more than human beings. Mm. But the other thing is as well, I mean, something like, I, I don't know, a thousand people or so die in Australia from car accidents. Now, if you had driverless cars everywhere and you had something like 10 people, uh, robots uh, driving us around and only 10 people die in the whole of Australia, but those 10 people, the robots drove them over a cliff or something like that, you know, and killed 10 people. They asked a whole lot of people, would you accept that? And a lot of them said no, because if they're going to be killed, they're going to be killed by another human being, not by some sort of robot or something like that. So that was quite interesting as well. That's very real. I, I used to, to talk about driving cars uh, to year six students. And um, this is before Tesla was in the country. And, um, and we used to talk about uh, driverless vehicles and, and, and even people that young who don't drive themselves also struggled with, with, that, with that issue. There's something very disturbing about the fact that it's not attributable to human fault. Um, well, there was a time when we used to have elevator drivers mm. uh, and now they're driverless and have been for quite some time. I wonder if it just isn't a question of time before we get used to them. Uh, it'll take a, it's a bit of a shock to adapt to them, but I, I think we'll get used to them the same as we do with elevators. I think that's Actually. true to a lot of extent, yes. Yeah. And, and, and with, with airplanes now, you know, big airliners, uh, pilots are often there really for show, right? I mean, the autopilot does an awful lot of work um, and you could probably fully automate a flight and it probably would be safer because crashes are human error. But people prefer to have right. somebody up the front with a nice Edinburgh accent who's going to tell them about how nice the, uh, the food is going to be. Problem is you get a human error from the programming as well, like those two plane crashes where the plane took off and they said it wasn't going uh, fast enough. It needed to actually go down and it went into the side of the mountain as well. So Oh, it's um, not perfect. Definitely not perfect. But... But I think, I think this is the issue with, with uh, driverless cars, right? Is that if you could remove all of the humans from the road, driverless cars would be much, much easier, right? So it's the fact that we've got people that still want to be on the road with robotic cars that causes the problem. Um, and, you know, I think, think we're, I, I'm actually very positive about driverless cars and even driverless planes, et cetera, in the future. I think they will work once we are willing to step back in the same way as Timo was saying, that we step back 
and said, okay, the lift can actually get me from floor one to floor three without there having to be a driver on board. Except for the fact that some people actually like driving as well. So going out for the Sunday drive is sort of a human sort of enjoyment. Um, just going from one place to another, going to work or through traffic, driverless car, yes, um, fine. But if you want to go for a country drive, I know what I'd prefer. There'd be theme parks for people like that, right? They can go and, <laughs> go and drive around yeah. the theme park. <laughs> Graham, you'd be able to do that in your car driving simulator at home on your iPhone. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, so actually thinking about getting one in when the, when the need arises. <laughs> let's uh, let's let's change the topic a little bit now. Um, getting back to to, to to sci-fi, I'd like to ask everyone um, what what aspect of sci-fi uh, gets, and I guess it's more movies gets gets you out of your chair shouting in protest. Well, could I come in here? Uh, oh, please do, Robert. yeah. yeah uh, do, my, my claim to notoriety is I'm a friend of Tibor's. Ah. Um, uh, I, I, one, one movie that comes to mind really is uh, Ex Machina, mm. uh, which was an excellent movie about uh, a, a, an eccentric billionaire who produces an AI machine that built as a, as a robot. Uh, and there's a paradox in the, in the movie in that uh, they they bring in an, a specialist to test the bot. Uh, they do the Turing test on the robot to see whether it actually has uh, agency. And the problem is that once achieving whether the 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 uh, robot has agency is a great technological achievement. But having done so, it then becomes a threat to humanity. Now the robot actually has agency, and it works this out. And it becomes an intellectual battle between humans and the robot. Uh, if anybody has seen the movie, the robot wins. And it gets out into, into the population uh, as a human being. And of course, there should be a next chapter to the story, but, but there wasn't a sequel. Maybe the next one is uh, Blade Runner. <laughs> Yeah, no, that uh, that uh, that was a great movie, and uh, I agree with everything you said. Well, what is it about billionaires? They've um, got lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> Simple, huh? Yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They can they can do all of these science projects on their own in their own mm. uh, laboratory, hidden away from everyone. That that, that would take you know a, 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 a whole research institute decades to do, like like Iron Man. You know, just knocking out a fusion reactor of an afternoon. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I, I liked X, uh, X Machina, but can I add a little thing about AI that um, I think people miss out on? They talk about, about AI being as smart as a human. And um, I, I read a lot of stuff on AI recently, and they were talking about, you know, AI at the moment might be as smart as a cat or whatever creature you want to compare it to. But they were pointing out that, you know, the... Uh, uh, one morning, AI is going to wake up and it's going to be as smart as the stupidest person on the planet, right? And by late afternoon, it'll be smarter than the smartest person that's ever lived in, mm. in a tiny time frame. Yeah. It will just go on beyond that kind of thing because the, the, the distribution of intelligence of human beings, of, even though we think it's great, is actually very narrow and AI will just trundle its way through there. So this, this notion that we will have this intelligence, which is our equal, might be something we enjoy for an early afternoon before it supersedes us and heads off into the distance. Yes. So, so that's going to be an interesting thing. And I've read a lot of warnings on AI about how quickly this could happen and how quickly it could get out of control. It happened with the computer that uh, beat the world champion at the game of Go. Uh, the machine was taught the basic rules of the game and they plugged two machines together and they taught each other how to play and they were world champions within a, a very short time. I think it was just a matter of days or hours or something. So the learning um, computer, yes, the learning computers, they, there's something happened in radiotherapy and stuff where the, um, the computers reading um, images of x-rays and stuff, whether someone's got breakages or cancer or something like that, the computer is about 95% accurate, whereas the, uh, the radiologists are only about 85% um, accurate. So um, there's going to come a time when people are going to say, okay, I've had my scan, I have my x-ray, but I want the computer to give me the analysis of it. For sure, yeah. No, I think, Gary, you're absolutely right. Uh, 
if if AI does take off, it'll take off and surpass us in no time at all. That's for sure. I think that's that, that's almost a given. There's, really no, there's no reason why human intelligence has to be the be all and end all of intelligence. I mean, if, I I would like a diagnosis from the IBM computer anyway. I mean, uh, they 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 fed it with a load of clinical data on cancer diagnosis and. Um, uh, it it agreed after being trained it agreed with with all of the all of the diagnoses uh, except for the ones where it found mistakes and um mm. you know i mean the human brain is is just just not capable of being a medical practitioner and keeping up with all of the medical research at the same time um so why wouldn't you want something that's got sort of a, a virtually unlimitless memory bank <laughs> Never um, forgets. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But you also uh, got the husky effect as well. Have you heard of the husky effect? No. They, they, the husky, husky effect was they get, they show the AI um, all these pictures of a husky, and they kept saying, "Oh no, it's a, it's a uh, wolf and things like that." And it kept saying, "Wolf, wolf, wolf" all the time, and I couldn't understand why it was calling the husky a wolf. And the, the thing was that the computer was looking at all these images of the husky. Uh, of uh, being out in the snow, the so snow was always in the background. So it was sort of, well, the wolves in the in the snow and the huskies, sort of similar to a, in some respects, to the uh, to the wolf uh, to the um, to the wolf. So they're, they're saying that uh, you know it's that they didn't recognise that it was the background that the computer was often uh, analysing rather than the uh, the organism itself. So mm. that's a training and semantics problem, and and. That's well, I guess you have to learn that there are huskies in the snow as well. So you have to teach the AI and, and the AI has to learn mm -hmm. the difference. And then it, it can do it like everybody else. There's, there's really nothing that an AI machine can't do that a human can. I, I don't think that there's a difference between the kind of intelligence that AI has <coughs> me, and the kind of intelligence that we humans have. I think you're either intelligent or not. Uh, and in fact, that's a question I'd like to ask. Um, what's artificial about artificial intelligence? Um, is there a difference in kind between AI and just intelligence as we understand the word? Or is it really just a question of uh, uh, AI being brain damaged intelligence or something? Uh, I, I actually dine out on the story. I trade on the fact that I think I am artificially intelligent. Um, uh, purely because I don't think there's a difference. Uh, I just don't know what the difference is. Uh, too, well, I think it's generally accepted that for for something, for some organism, or whether it's a, a computer, an AI, or whether it's even an alien, that in order to be intelligent, it needs some sort of consciousness. So I think that's pretty much general agreement somewhere. So your big question is, can a um, computer um, actually achieve consciousness, which uh, intelligent creatures are expected to do? I mean, Basically, we don't have too many ex examples to go on, but that's the generally accepted sort of idea. Yeah. So. Well, this computer here certainly has managed to develop in, uh, consciousness. So uh, uh, I, I don't think that's a criterion for distinguishing between the two. Um, I think it, it's a feature of it, yes, but I think AI will be capable of it just as much as we are. So, we just have not yet built a computer that's got 100 trillion bits like our head has. So in the in the recording I did this morning, I, we discussed this as well. And I think uh, it, in various discussions I've seen on AI, the issue is is the question of creativity, about coming up with something new. And that's where AI is currently lacking. AI can mimic. It could produce a brand new Turner print based upon all of the Turner pictures it's ever looked at. But whether or not it could come up with a, a new style of art right um is something that we we don't know we don't know how our creativity works and we don't know how a computer would do it and the other problem is is that would we even recognize creativity if it's not human-based creativity would we appreciate that you know a, a ai generated art or music or even science right would we we look at it and say that's what I understand as being science. So there, there's a creative aspect, which I think is still very fluffy when it comes to AI. Yeah, mind you, there, there is a whole lot of creativity in modern art that I don't recognize as creativity, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say. 
And may, I ask, sorry. <laughs> and may I ask, is there a difference between agency and consciousness? What is the opinion there? Ooh. I don't think anybody really knows, do they? I mean, as, 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 mm -hmm. I mean, consciousness is yet another one of those cloud concepts, right? Where there's yeah. no sharply defined edges. And, you know, I, I'm a big fan of uh, evolutionary history. And where do you draw the line on consciousness between us and various members of the animal kingdom? Mm. Right? You know, chimpanzees and then down to... Uh, what about challenges. coral? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Exactly. A, a dog's conscious, right? I mean, yes. you said, so, so or, dogs, are, but, but are coral. No, yeah. no. I, or, I mean, or, or, or is it sentience? Is it, I, is it I, a, a concept of oneself? Well, you know, um, what does that mean? It, it's, yeah. it's sort of yes or no, because I, I did actually study it for quite a few years, and that was, um, um, I mean, chimpanzees, for example, I mean, the thing is, yeah, human beings are very are conscious, and they're obviously the most intelligent creature on the earth, but it's a grading effect. Yeah. So chimpanzees, dogs and stuff, they, they do have some sort of consciousness, but have a lower sort of level. So, for example, if you've got a, a, a quite a very young child and you put a cross on its forehead, it's not going to recognise that the, the one in the mirror has been themselves. But they've done that with chimpanzees and they, they've gone to sleep and put a cross on the forehead, put them in the mirror, and they've actually felt their head and said, hey, you know, that's me in the mirror. So it's, you know, so a lot of people believe that consciousness does extend down, um, you know, to dogs. I'm not saying they extend down to cockroaches and things like that, but it's sort of like a grading effect. I mean, intelligence does extend down to the animal kingdom, although it's difficult to define, but... I, I think consciousness does that to some degree as well. So, I mean, if human beings three million years ago, if you want to call them human beings, I'm sure they had some sort of level of consciousness, but maybe not as much as they have now. Sort of wraps back yeah. to, to, to um, you know, the sci-fi in, in in a way. I find the um, the concept of the Force in Star Wars very compelling, and I think this is it, it, it's like uh, almost that um, every bit of the universe has a little bit of something and when you when you can assemble it in a sufficiently sophisticated thing then it then it aggregates up to a consciousness and um, but there's no there's no uh, like the discussion we've just had i mean uh, it doesn't matter where you draw the line between conscious and unconscious it's still drawing a line whether you draw it at the particle level or the dog level that doesn't really make any difference at some point you're, you're saying on this side it has the aspects of whatever life and on the other side it doesn't and um you know i think uh there's some really quite com compelling things in 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 the force in star wars <laughs> on, on mm -hmm. that that that, uh, that one really resonates with me do, do you mean the force as in the original three or the force as retconned in the uh, prequels <gasps> as being the mitochlorian bugs in your bloodstream? Oh, geez. I, no, I wasn't even aware of that. No, ah, I meant the, okay. the, 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 <laughs> yeah. 19, yeah, the 1977. Number, number four, five maybe. and six. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anakin Skywalker. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, consciousness uh, or the concepts of consciousness and intelligence and so on. Uh, play a very large role in our uh, science fiction. Uh, it, it appears everywhere. Uh, but if I think of consciousness as an emergent effect uh, ra uh, and, and give up on the idea that there's such a thing as an atom of consciousness, uh, which I don't think there is, uh, then uh, uh, it becomes a continuum. It's not something which is like a switch where you can turn consciousness on and if you don't have the switch, then you're just not conscious. I, I don't think that's how it works. I think it is a continuum. Uh, it does, uh, doesn't work like that. I mean, the thing is, uh, doctors say people are getting dementia as they get old. Old the dementia gets worse and worse. That they've often described that people treat them as, as almost like their consciousness is seeping away as as they get worse and worse into dementia. So certain consciousness, you know, can vary even in a person's life. I mean, if you get a, a baby or that's one years of age, I mean, it's not going to be as conscious or conscious as say an adult human being so it can sort of rise to a maximum and it can actually decrease especially if you have some sort of illness in older life or even have a car accident and and have brain damage for something yeah no no i think it's a continuum uh, elizabeth irvine an american philosopher wrote a book once in which she showed uh, or pretty conclusively argued pretty conclusively 
the consciousness is not a scientifically well-defined term. <laughs> and I, of course, I agree. It has to be. Okay, uh, uh, one of the questions I, I have here, um, uh, and, and uh, Kiralee, uh, I think, uh, made reference to this, going back to movies, um, that they often have to make compromises to, to make it watchable. Um, did, did any of you have uh, pet hates when it comes to shortcuts that they take in, in films? Oh, for, for, me, for me, it's definitely the time, the time issue. You know, things take a long time, but movies are only three or four hours long nowadays. Still a long time, but um, yeah, for me, it's the time issue, how long things take. You cannot have a conversation between Houston and Apollo 13 in real time, really. So yeah, that that's my issue. I was watching The, the Martian the other day and mm -hmm. strangely, they, they pay respect to that at the beginning of the movie, but at the end, they, they, they shrink it to zero. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not even consistent through the movie, but they, uh, it's not too bad. I guess I didn't, I think, you know, it didn't, it didn't detract from the movie apart from like, have me out of the chair going, come on. Oh. So, so, uh, uh, go go ahead. ahead. Oh, sorry. One of the things that drives me crazy is artificial <laughs> gravity, right? Mm. Because they, they go to, well, firstly, you know, you spend the first few minutes of the movie with people doing this and, and, and weightless, et cetera. And then they sort of spin their spaceship up. And they say, oh, we've got artificial gravity. And then they can seem to walk wherever they want to. And then the, the roots of artificial gravity the, and how it changes as you move around are just never considered. And of course, it's just so you could film it on, on a, in a film studio rather than have to worry about that kind of thing. Um, but I, just, I did watch The Stowaway on Netflix recently. Yeah, I saw that one too. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was yeah. pretty good, I thought. Yeah, and they, they did consider, they didn't consider it perfectly, but they did consider what happens as you move along a, a rotating spacecraft and how gravity will change. They didn't consider the, the Coriolis forces, which would be pushing them sideways. But at I... least they, they did wonder about how gravity would flip around. But still, once they were inside their little cabin, then everything was like, I'm sitting here on Earth, and it's all great. They went to such... Uh, uh good lengths to get that largely right and then they dropped the the canister and it went off in a straight, a straight line. line yeah i know i know it's, it's, <laughs> but th that was because you needed to see it, it you, mm. i mean if, if it went off and then went off at an angle and disappeared that way you'd say oh that was a bit strange but mm. as a physicist we would say well that's a rotating <laughs> reference frame i understand that's right. that but, but yeah exactly exactly I, I could understand the artistic view of yeah. that shot Anyone else have any pet peeves about uh, about movies? It's, it's not really a pet thing. I, it's something which no one else has discussed at the moment, um, and that is um, there are some science fiction. I actually like a lot of them. They're, they're actually quite violent sort of ones like Alien and things like that and Terminator. Uh, I mean, a lot of people watch movies for the special effects. Some, a lot of science fiction get criticised because the, the storyline, they haven't developed the characters and that. But I, I, I love the special effects in Star Wars. I love the special effects in Aliens. And, and, and a lot of those like, are very, um, you know, they are quite violent sort of ones. So how do people feel about the violent ones like Alien? I hope we've all heard of Alien and Terminator and things like that. They're certainly science fiction and they've been extremely, extremely popular in the box office as against ones like 2001, which was, again, very, very sort of popular, but there was very little violence in that one there, except in a few places. Yeah, I, I don't think violence is necessary for good sci-fi. I'm not a fan of violence, I have to say. Uh, a, lot of people, a lot of people enjoy violent movies. I don't know why. Um, they get a thrill out of it or make well, an adrenaline rush. I could say maybe violence is a bad word. Maybe I should say um, heavy action. Yeah, okay. uh, look, I'm a, I'm, I think Aliens is probably the best sequel ever made of any movie. It's better than Godfather 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm a big fan of Alien. I'd, I've watched all the Terminator movies. Um, the, I don't see those as essentially um, science fiction movies. I mean, Alien is really a horror movie in space, right? Mm. It's, it's, the, it's the, almost the creature in the haunted house kind of, kind of picture. Um, 
yeah, look, I, I, I think, I think having a science fiction story, which is really just 2001 kind of stories is not going to work all the time because it doesn't cover all of the emotions that people go to watch movies for, right? I mean, there's different movies have uh, give you different emotions. That's true. And, and different genres. I mean, you know, suspense in sci-fi movies like Alien, you know, you're on the edge of your seat and where's the alien and what's going to happen next and who's going to die? You know, suspense, there's gore, there's there's different um, genres. And I think different people will, will enjoy the different genres for the genre, uh, where, whether it's set in a Western movie or in, in space or, or a combination. Sometimes I think uh, if you look, look at the alien uh, uh, movies, um, yeah, the reason that uh, so little was shown in the first movie is they just simply couldn't do it. And um, I, I think um, that, that made it all the better. Um, 1979 or thereabouts. Yeah, and, and yeah. as time has gone on, and uh, if you look at the Alien Covenant, uh, the most recent one, it's extremely graphic, but not nearly as scary. And um, it's almost a shortcut, I think, to put in all of this action because it just it just fills up minutes. But it it you know it's just like, yeah, yeah. that was all right. So, yeah, yeah. Alien was a horror movie. Mm. Aliens was an action movie. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, see, good different different movies, and both excellent, I should say. Mm. And what about Terminator, um, Durant? You put them in the same uh, category as uh, Aliens, or? Uh, yeah, no, no. A Terminator is a bit more of a drama, right? It's it's not it's a, a drama action more than anything. It, I mean, it does have that thread, it, and it it is actually reasonably clever with its time travel. Only reasonably. Oh, yeah, time travel, yeah. Okay. Yeah, only reasonably clever. It's not as clever as Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which <laughs> gets time travel spot on. Mm -hmm. Um, but but it it does it quite well. But it's it's to set up. You know, what, what's the saying? There's only seven original stories and, you know, somebody goes on a journey, etc. So you can sort of, you can sort of see where this is coming from. It's another one of those stories where somebody is hunting somebody down and the motive here is something to do with time travel and what's going to happen in the future. So it's just a different spin on a story that's been told before. The, the, uh, Bill and Ted's uh, 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 excellent Great adventure. Reference is yeah. that the i think one of the most fantastic moments in any movie was the realization when they were trying to get the keys to get into the dad's absolutely um, uh, police station so i know we'll go back in time we'll go back in time and i'll get the keys and i'll hide them somewhere like underneath this plant pot awesome but they they even remembered <laughs> to go back and do it later on in the movie like yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Bang! Yeah. Exactly. Very, very clever. Very, very clever. Does anybody remember the early series of Star Trek, the first series, which was an experimental of course, series? Everyone, everyone knows that. It wasn't successful it in the United States. It was very right. successful overseas. And I remember one episode particularly, and it's, I don't remember how long ago this was, 50 years ago, maybe? Uh, I think it's that, in the 60s. Mid-60s. Okay, that's all that long. Almost uh, I remember this ago. particular this episode where Star Trek comes across this planet. And it's been a constant war for, for generations. And of course, of course, they're not allowed to interfere, but there they are, they're watching it and wondering, well, can they help in any way? And they get the two member, the member, of, e member of each group onto the ship to discuss whether there's some way that they can, Star Trek can mediate. Now, both of these, these humanoid people were uh, half black and half white on their faces. Uh, and throughout the, the, the program, you don't pick up the fact that there's a racial prejudice involved here because the black and the white are on opposite sides of the faces. Mm -hmm. And that was the prejudice. I thought such a movie, that, that, that sort of sci-fi was extremely powerful and well ahead of its time. Very thought provoking. Yeah. Star, Star Trek definitely was um, and still is ahead of its time in terms of its um, the way it treats diversity and you know um, women hold hold roles of you know captain and admiral 
Um, you know, I think this is something that really ages a lot of a lot of my favourite sci-fi books, like from um, Robert Heinlein or Philip K. Dick. Um, a lot of them are aged, or even Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, they're aged because of the way that women are dealt with within you know, within the text. Oh, she's off making a cup of tea. Let's make a plan for what we're going to do to, you know, save the world while she goes off and makes a cup of tea. And that drives me nuts. It sort of really detaches me from from the story after that. Well, the recent Star Trek, Kimberly has a, uh, the captain being a female. That's uh, the Star Trek, what's it called there? Like Discovery. Uh, Discovery, yeah. Yeah, a, a number of them did. Uh, Voyager had uh, Captain Janeway. That was an yeah. awesome, sure. awesome one. So yeah, I mean they've they've done this for a while. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting how how diversity issues um, and and forethought how people look forward into the future. How will it diversity be in the future? You know, mm -hmm. so Robert, that was a really good point actually um, about this racial uh, interracial issues. And I, I think I think that's a really good place to wrap it up. That uh, you know that 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 Star Trek uh, really. Um, started a lot of that movement so early on and uh, and has influenced so many people and and improved um our, our society in so many ways so uh we've actually reached 9 30 believe it or not yeah. um so uh i think we should wrap it up and let and let people go and make some hot chocolate i, or... I should i should say this is a good place to end because we've just opened that can of aliens Right? And what kind of aliens could be out there in the universe? And we're not going to talk about it now. So that mm. means we'll have to come back at another time. So um, uh, let me just uh, thank uh, our three panelists today, uh, Tibor, Kirli, and Geraint, very much for, for being with us. Um, uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this uh, again. I hope uh, everyone else has as well. Um, uh, just to let you know that uh, we will be doing this again. Um, and uh, roughly monthly until we get bored and run out of things. But we've got a long list of things uh, that we, we would like to, to, to talk about. Um, uh, the next one we've got planned on uh, May the 26th, which is a Wednesday as well, same time. Um, it uh, it co coincides with a blood moon and a total lunar eclipse, apparently. And uh, so we're going to do uh, do one on uh, moon, the moon, lunacy and technology, uh, anything to do with the moon, um, permanent settlement, mining of helium, uh, tourism, influence of uh, the moon on our culture. So uh, uh, look at uh, my email is easy to find. Um, uh, so if you have any ideas uh, about that, that you want covered, uh, please uh, send them in. Um, and um, yeah, well, thank you very much, everyone, for, for attending tonight. I hope you enjoyed it and um, uh, see you next time. All right. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. See you Thanks. later. See you later. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, everyone. Bye.